it is time for an amp dyno. I don't know if this is old enough to be classified as old school. This amplifier dates back to about 2008. This is the Alpine MRP M500. It was replaced in 2013 by the MRV M500. Funny enough, they're both called V Power. I've had this amp for ages and it's time to find out if this old Alpine amp can still do its rated power. This is a monoblock amplifier rated for 300 watts into a 4 ohm load. I've got my resistor bank set up for a 4 ohm load, so let's turn the volume up and let's see what kind of power this thing puts out. For this test, we've got an SMD DD1 Plus that's going to light up when it hits 1% total harmonic distortion. At 1% THD, we get 424, almost 428 watts, which is quite a bit more than the rated power. Let's go ahead and turn it on up and see what we get at clipping. 436 watts. This thing is comfortably underrated. Let's rewire the resistor bank for a two ohm test. Now we're looking for 500 watts into a two ohm load. Let's crank up the volume and let's see what we get. We're using an SMD DD1 Plus to check for 1% total harmonic distortion. And that happens at about 623 watts. 123 watts over the rated power. Let's crank it on up to clipping and see what happens. 651 watts. Y'all, this thing blows its ratings completely out of the water. And that's the beauty of brands like Alpine. They're definitely going to give you all of the power that they say they're going to give you, plus a little bit more. But that is power into a pure resistive load. And when you hook this thing up to a subwoofer, you're not running a pure resistive load. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in the video. So let's see what happens when we send a 40 Hertz test tone into an actual subwoofer. We're going to start off with a Dayton Audio Max X10 subwoofer. This thing is a dual two ohm voice coil. I've got it wired for four ohms. Let's crank up the volume. Let's see what kind of power we get out of this thing. Okay, so that's not good news. We're around 138 or 139 watts at 1% total harmonic distortion. What you're going to notice on the AMM1 is that we're not reading a 4 ohm load. That's because of a thing called box rise or impedance rise. And that's one of two things that are going to impact your actual real world power when you're running it on a subwoofer. We'll talk about these a little bit later in the video. Let's see what kind of power we can get at two ohms on a subwoofer. So here I've got a Kicker Comp R12. This subwoofer is rated for 500 watts. It's a dual four ohm subwoofer. I've got the voice calls wired in parallel to get a two ohm load. And as you can see on the AMM1, it's giving me about a four ohm load. Again, that's that impedance rise that I just talked about. Let's see what this old amp can do. 486 watts at 1% total harmonic distortion. Let's crank it on up to clipping. 489 watts at clipping nearly it's rated power. Why is it we got nearly rated power on one subwoofer and nowhere near rated power on the other? That's the difference in the subwoofers and the subwoofer enclosures. I'll tell you more about that later, just keep watching. But before we do that, let's look at the controls and the connections. You've got some speaker output terminals for your positive and negative. You got a pair of 30 amp fuses. And then you have the power connections. You've got your battery or your 12 volt positive connection, a remote turn on connection and your ground connection. On the other side of the amplifier, you've got a speaker level input as well as line level inputs. The amplifier comes with a pigtail that you can plug into those speaker level inputs. On that side, we also have a gain, a base EQ, which is your base boost. And we also have the low pass filter and that keeps the high frequencies out of your subwoofer. Pretty standard connections, pretty straightforward to hook up. Why don't we crack this puppy open? Let's get a nice gut shot. Everyone loves those sexy gut shots. All right, now the back cover is off and I have no idea what the hell I'm looking at. I know a lot about connecting amplifiers and setting them up so they sound good both in home and car audio. But once you crack open the amplifier, I don't have the slightest idea what I'm looking at. Now, if you're an amplifier expert and you know what's going on inside of the amplifier, feel free to tell me about it down in the comments because I need to learn more about the internal workings of an amplifier. 
Here we've got some 35 volt, 27 microfarad capacitors. Over here you have some good looking 25 volt, 22 microfarad capacitors. Here's something I do know, right here is the backside of the low level inputs and the RCA inputs. So that's where the signal is going into the amplifier board. And right beside those, you can see the backside of the three potentiometers that are used to control the gain, the bass boost, and the crossover. On the other side, we can see the speaker outputs along with the fuse bus. Further down the board, we can see where the power comes into the amplifier. It's labeled on the board, ground, remote, and power. And of course, right here, you have the actual chips that make the magic happen. Let's talk about why the amplifier couldn't do rated power when it was hooked up to an actual subwoofer. Well, there are two things that contribute to that. The first one I mentioned earlier is impedance rise. Some people call it box rise. And the other one is a thing known as power factor. I got a couple of videos explaining those two things. I'm gonna put them right over here. And before I go, I need to say thank you to all of my patrons over on Patreon. These people right here are my $10 patrons. Thanks guys, I appreciate your help with a special shout out to $25 patron Dylan. I'm the DIY Audio Guy and I will see you on the next adventure.